Right, first of all, I have to thank somebody, but I don't know whom to thank. I, I won an award last, last week, um, pretty big award too. This is an Excellence in Learning and Teaching Award from the university. This is a university level award. I've been here 15 years. I don't think I've ever been nominated for one of these. And this year, two students that I teach nominated me for this award. And the award's fine and dandy, it's very nice. But the, the real thing was what they, what they wrote. It was, it was quite touching. It made me feel like I'm actually maybe doing an okay job here. So thank you very much. On from that to scalene muscles this week. Scalene muscles in the neck. The reason I want to talk about these is because we seem to keep coming across the scalene muscles because there are a lot of structures nearby and run past them and through them but I don't think we've ever specifically talked about them. Um, I might have mentioned them in one of the breathing videos, but otherwise I couldn't, I couldn't find the time I, I talked. So we'll talk about the scalene muscles now, right? So, these are the scalene muscles here. Um, the, there's an ancient Greek word skalinos, meaning uneven. And you may remember from school, or maybe you're a mathematician, scalene, scalene triangles. So a scalene triangle is a triangle with, which is uneven. It has uh, sides of different lengths, I believe. Um, and that's what the two of the scalene muscles with the first rib make. They make an uneven triangle here. And we can see a vessel running through there. There are three scalene muscles. We will look to see where they are. They're in the neck what they run to and from, and by doing that we'll work out the movements that they cause. We'll look at their innovation, um, and then we'll talk about the other structures that pass through them, around them, on them and nearby. All right, that's the plan. Here are the three scalene muscles of the neck. They're considered deep muscles of the neck, um, and there are anterior scalene, middle scalene and posterior scalene muscles. And you may also hear them referred to as scalenus anterior, scalenus medius, and scalenus posterior. Boom, boom, boom. Now there's another muscle here, gotta watch out for this one. This is levator scapulae. This is actually running down to the scapula there, um, and it overlaps with scalenus posterior there. So we can see anterior scalene, middle scalene easily, and posterior scalene is a little bit hidden away there. Um, the anterior scalene muscles are considered prevertebral muscles or anterior vertebral muscles. They're anterior to the vertebral column, whereas the middle scalene and posterior scalene muscles are considered lateral vertebral muscles. These muscles are posterior to the cervical viscera, so we've got the larynx and the trachea and the pharynx and all that sort of stuff around there. So they're, they're, they're pretty much posterior to that level. Um, and if levator scapulae is back here, then we can see also sternocleidomastoid is wrapping over the top of them. We're seeing them popping up there in the posterior triangle. There's trapezius, there's sternocleidomastoid. So there's gonna be, you see there's anterior scalene, middle scalene. All right, so that's where they are. And they run from the cervical vertebrae to the first two ribs. And in fact, they run from the, the transverse processes of some of the cervical vertebrae to the first two ribs. There's a spider on your chin. Little money spider, you need, um, you need dusting. Um, can you see how the anterior scalene muscle is kind of running anteriorly to the first rib and the middle scalene muscle is running more laterally to the first rib and the posterior scalene muscle is running uh, laterally to the second rib. Um, so this means that they can move the cervical vertebrae, yours don't move, um, or they can move the ribs. So that's when we use them. So if you consider the two anterior scalene muscles are anterior, if they both work together, then they could give anterior flexion of the neck or you know, ventral flexion of the neck and the head like that. Whereas the middle and posterior scalene muscles working on one side would cause lateral flexion of the neck to one side 
or another. And then if the cervical vertebrae stay in position, and you contract those muscles, you elevate the first and second ribs. And if you elevate the first and second ribs, you're elevating, you know, you're lifting the rib cage, you're lifting the other ribs up and you're causing inspiration. So these are, um, what do we call them? They're extra muscles, they're accessory muscles of inspiration. So they help you with breathing. Um, I think if you, if you come across patients with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, I believe that the diaphragm changes, it gets flatter, and these muscles actually get bigger because they start doing more work um, because of the nature of COPD, okay? More specifically, um, well, even more specifically, these transverse processes of the cervical vertebrae have got two tubercles on them. It's like an anterior tubercle and a posterior tubercle, little sticky 80 bits. Anterior scalene muscle comes off the anterior tubercles of some of the vertebrae. Posterior and middle scalene muscles come from the posterior tubercles of the transverse processes. I'm sure it's far more useful just to remember that they come from the transverse processes of the cervical vertebrae. But the anterior scalene muscle runs from the transverse processes of cervical vertebrae C3 to C6 down to the first rib. The middle scalene muscle runs from the transverse processes of C2 to C7 down to the first rib, a bit more laterally. And the posterior scalene muscle runs from the transverse processes of C5 to C7 vertebrae down to the second rib. Now that's one description. You, if you read around, are likely to read a number of different descriptions, but you get the gist. I imagine there probably is a little bit of variability between people, there's certainly a fair bit of variability between textbooks. So what about innovation then? Well now we're getting, we're starting to get to it. Um, we can see the brachial plexus running to the upper limb here, passing out from between the anterior and middle scalene muscles. And the brachial plexus is going to contribute some innovation to the scalene muscles. Um, also around here, we have a cervical plexus which is looping around with the anterior cervicalis and other bits and bobs and generally supplying innovation to the muscles of the neck. So the cervical plexus and the brachial plexus are both going to innovate, they're both going to send nerves to the scalene muscles. Uh, specifics, if you want to know levels, well, the anterior scalene muscle is described as receiving nerves from spinal levels C4, C5 and C6. The middle scalene muscle um, is described as receiving innovation from levels C3 to C8. And the posterior scalene muscle is described as receiving innovation from levels C7 to C8. Um, but then you also read that the anterior scalene can receive innovation from levels C5 to C7. But you see some link there between the vertebrae the muscles attached to and the nerve roots that then go on to innovate these muscles, right? Um, again, you'll read different textbooks, you'll read a fair bit of variability between people and between textbooks to levels of innovation. <clears throat> Is it a useful, bit of thing, a useful bit of detail to remember? I have no idea. But now we get on to the bit that I think is interesting, and that's the stuff that's nearby. Now what can we, what can we see? There are only a few structures, but they're really important. Now, as I said before, if there's the anterior scalene, and there's the middle scalene muscle, they're forming a gap. So the interscalene triangle is the triangle formed by anterior and middle scalene muscles and the first rib. And through that triangle, through that gap, we see the brachial plexus running through there, that huge bundle of nerves that's going to innervate the upper limb, and we see the subclavian artery. They go through that gap. What about the subclavian vein? Well, that's here. Um, can we see on the other side? We can see it here. So that that we can actually see, which means it's not being covered up by these muscles. So the subclavian vein is running anterior to the anterior scalene muscle. Um, we can see the common carotid artery medial to it. And the other thing that we always use this as a landmark. So whenever we're dissecting the neck, we can find these muscles quite easily. Once you've found the muscle, you tend to find a nerve running along the anterior surface of the anterior scalene muscle. And that's the phrenic nerve that's going to continue down to the pericardium and down to the diaphragm. 
So that means that if there is a narrowing of the uh, interscalene triangle for any reason, like hypertrophy of these two muscles, it's going to be the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery that get affected. If the brachial plexus gets affected, then we're talking about you know nerve things, numbness, pins and needles, and that sort of thing. And if the subclavian artery gets affected, then we might see reduced blood flow to the to the upper limb. But that's it. Now we've done it. I feel better. I feel better. Now we've done it, we've talked about the scalene muscles. Whenever I bring them up, I expect you to know, <laughs> know what we're talking about. All right, good. Okay, right, see you guys next week then. <laughs>